What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of the Orlando Magic, P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25's mission, my mission, is really to connect business owners to their ideal peers, customers, and referral partners. And that's really been my life's mission. So when Tim comes on, I meet him. I want, I'm always looking for who I know that he could also know, and that's why I love bringing him on. But we do this in two major ways. One is we help your company completely run and launch your own podcast. We distribute it across 11 or more different channels, including a dedicated blog post we put on social media. So you can just show up and talk, and we do everything else. Um, John and I have been collectively podcasting for 15 years, and I credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life. Besides making best friends, finding my business partner, it's open relationships for customers and many referral partners as well. Um, We also have a done-for-you lead generation service where we manage a consistent outreach to your ideal clients and referral sources. This is not paid traffic, by the way. It's done manually. Um, Since it does require a lot of humans to do the work, we have limited bandwidth, so we only want to work with the right company. So if any of that sounds interesting, go to rise25.com and contact us. I am very excited, as I said, a huge proponent of podcasting, and I've heard of Tim's tool, and I recommend Tim's tool. Um, Today, we have Tim Sinclair, founder of ringer.com, and it's spelled R-I-N-G-R.com, so you get it right. Ringer allows you to record a conversation with anyone anywhere in the world and have it sound like you're in the same room. Users of Ringer have interviewed Emmy winners, New York Times bestsellers, CEOs, athletes, and many more. Uh, Tim is one that knows the spoke, the power of the spoken word. Uh, Tim, I was trying to pull up this, um, you announcing the Pacers. Um, and so you may have heard him describing the taste of a sausage and muffin, McDonald's, interviewing guests on radio, television, podcasts, or introducing the world's most popular athletes to a stadium filled with 60,000 screaming fans. I want to go to one of these games and hear you announce it. Um, by now, Tim's voice has probably been heard by millions around the world. He's worked with Audi. I mentioned McDonald's, Indiana Pacers, University of Illinois, the Chicago Fire, many more. Tim, thank you for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. That's a heck of an introduction, but I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, just tell me about the ske- your schedule even next week. You run Ringer. You're going from – tell me a little bit about what you'll be doing <laughs> next week. Uh, yeah, next week I generally work a day at a time. Like what city do I have to be in and do I have to be wearing makeup because I do some TV too. And so that, that sort of uh, changes things from time to time. But next week uh, on like Tuesday night, for example, I'll be in Indianapolis doing the Pacers game versus the Bulls. And then I'll be driving either that night or early the next morning to Chicago to work at the United Center, not for the Bulls, but for the University of Illinois, who's taking on Ohio State that night. And then uh, over the weekend, we've got uh, more Illinois basketball and Pacers basketball. So uh, it's, uh, it's a busy schedule. Well, if you need someone to carry your mic and bag, I'm there for you. So <laughs> you are not the first person to make that I'll offer. Just drive, it's it's not a far drive from Chicago to the United States. Not Center. bad. Um, not bad. So I want to talk about it. All started on a napkin, quote unquote, supposedly at McAllister's Deli, 2014. Um, what was the original idea? And you were working in radio at the time. Yeah, I'd spent about 15, 16 years in radio at that point, and I'd had this idea for a couple of years before that, but uh, I literally had no background in tech development and running a business. I was a radio guy, plain and simple, Um, but I wanted to make my life easier and my show sound better, and so I started to come up with, hey, what if we used uh, all these technological devices that we were all carrying around in our pockets to uh, make audio for radio sound better Yeah, and developed an idea but had no idea how to implement it and it literally was with a friend of mine who I was just starting to get to know Adam McAllister's Deli I'm like sketching some ideas I'm like this is what I'm thinking do you know people who can do this and uh, Chad said I do. I just started a company with a couple of guys, one of which is one of the world's uh, more, and is the foremost expert in audio stuff. Wow. Um, and said, 
I think they would love this. And that was really the uh, the start of what became Ringer. That was what I was going to ask because, like, you know, putting together a team to do this is not always easy. I know you need a couple different skill sets. Um, how did you get the the technical people on board, or was was he one who had kind of already, you know, uh, had that talent there? Yeah, I kind of stumbled on it quite accidentally. It's a big hire, obviously. If you don't have a co-founder and you're just going to launch something, finding the right tech team is is huge. And I happened to – I talked to a couple people about it in those previous years when I was wrestling with the idea. And most everybody who was doing apps at that point was just turning a website into an app. I, and they, they weren't doing all the tech stuff that was required for this. But when I told Chad the idea, he went, I – I know a couple guys who can handle this. Uh, one, they both have their PhDs. One of them is the, the audio expert. One of them is yeah. more of a systems architect. Chad is more of a front-end user interface guy. And between the three of them and then with my vision and direction, we were able to pull it off. Now, you know, I'm sure those guys could be working on a lot of different types of projects. How do you convince them that this is what they should be focusing in on? Well, I, I don't bring much to the table. Um, in fact, I'm writing. <laughs> That's not I'm a writing good a convincing book. statement. <laughs> well, <laughs> hope you didn't um, open with that. I I, I didn't. Um, okay. The book is uh, that I'm working on right now. It's called Smart Startup: The Fine Art of Being the Dumbest Guy in the Room. Okay. Um, and I really feel like in every room I'm in in this crazy journey of the startup uh, that that I don't know enough. Um, but one thing I can do, and my, my background in radio helped me do, was be able to uh, rally troops and provide a compelling, convincing argument about what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. And uh, I think between the idea and um, the ability to raise money, bring on the right employees, and sort of spearhead something that uh, everybody could see the finish line to, um, that was enough for them to go, you know what, uh, we want to take a shot at this. And um like I said, I, I can't program a line of code or design a website, but uh, I can hopefully inspire and encourage people. And uh, that's been a, a huge help along this journey. So what did you tell them when you went to them and you wanted them to work on, on at the time, the idea of Ringer? Yeah, the, the first thing I wanted to find out was how much is this going to cost, right? So uh, if you guys can do this and are excited about doing it, how much is it going to cost me? And I, I mean, I had no money, so I guess the answer didn't really matter. Um, but I, I wanted to know sort of where we were. And uh, they came back with a number that was way higher than any amount that I could have ever come up with. And so like uh, any clueless creative would tend to do, I called the richest person I knew and said, what do I do? You know, this is, this is what I'm thinking, uh, but, but you're a business guy. I'm not telling me to help me. And I, I think I was probably secretly hoping he'd write me a check. Uh, but he didn't. Uh, he did, however, put me in touch with an angel investment group on campus at university of Illinois and said, I do some investing with them. Maybe they can give you some insight. Hmm. And, uh, I made that phone call and, uh, it wasn't too many days later that they had said, well, we'll invest some money. We'll help you raise some more money. And uh, hopefully, between all those different things, we can we can get a, a proof of concept off the ground. What was the idea you went to the investors with? What did you tell them? Well, I said I'd spent 15 years in radio, and all of our phone calls sound like trash. I mean, mm. you have great content from an author, an artist, an athlete, whoever, um, but you can't hear them. And everybody's experienced that, right? You hear the host coming through loud and clear, and then it's like whoever they're talking to, you got to turn the radio way up to even sort of understand and there's static and dropout and delay and all that kind of stuff. So there was so a big said, pain point there. Yes. And, and I had lived it. And everybody who's listened to the radio for any length of time has lived it. And I said, I think we can solve some of this problem. Um, and here's how I want to do it. And they saw the possibility for uh, that to work and knew that it would take a little money to get done, but had faith in me as a founder and in the idea as a whole that they decided to jump in. So... <clears throat> Tim, I was reading that you did around six months of research um, kind of before launching. Um, what did you discover in that six months? Yeah, we did a lot of different things during that time. Um, part of it was fundraising to go, all right, if we're going to put out a product that people want, we're going to have to have the money to do it. Um, part of that was um, sort of in the who wants to be a millionaire style. We were kind of asking the audience and phoning a friend and doing all those things to try to figure out uh, what people do want. Now, 
I love uh, Henry Ford's quote of, you know, if I ask people what they really want, they would have said a faster horse. Um, right. And, of course, he created the car. I, I don't want to just ask people what they want and then try to create that. But I did want to know if what I was creating is something they would want. Uh, and so I polled a whole bunch of people that I knew from mainly the radio world, some of the podcasting world, and said, is this something you're interested in? If so, would you be willing to pay for it? If so, how much? Uh, those kinds of questions to start going, mm -hmm. what is going to solve the problem, not just for me, but for the masses? And then how do we put together something that uh, fits that, but also is um, uh, forward thinking and, and stuff that can't be done now in other ways? What was some of the feedback? What were the difference in between the radio company's feedback and then the podcast uh, feedback? Yeah, that's interesting. I think from the very beginning, I felt like this was a radio thing. Um, in 2014, podcasting had it had hit its first spike and it had sort of dipped then for quite a while and was starting to ramp back up then. Uh, and so I knew about it and I knew it was a thing, but I thought predominantly this is going to be radio. Um, and I was really wrong. Mm. Uh, podcasting, just by its very definition, is all pre-recorded. <laughs> I mean, some people will stream their podcast live, but uh, in general, it's all pre-produced and, and played back at a later time, which is perfect for what we do. Radio, in a lot of cases, uh, in cer certainly talk radio, is live, and, and we can't fix the live problem nearly as well as we can fix the recorded problem. So I, I found out pretty quickly that uh, people who are recording interviews for use at a later date on radio, uh, this was going to work really well for them. But uh, in terms of a large group of people all adopting a technology uh, off the bat, podcasting really uh, stepped to the plate on that one. So you mentioned fix the recording. I noticed when I was reading some of the features, um, something magical happens when it uploads to your server. So talk about what happens there. Yeah, the nutshell is uh, people who've worked in radio or podcasting for a long, long time have heard the name Double Ender, which uh, is sort of a weird name for recording each side of the conversation separately. So, for example, you and I are having a conversation. You're in the Chicago area. I'm a few hours south of you. Your device, computer, phone, whatever, would be recording you, and mine would be recording me, and all of the transmission, noise, static, delay, dropout, etc., cetera, um, is gone because th that's not being recorded. And then those two parts are being put together on the back end and, and synced, and now it sounds like we're in the same room at the same time. Uh, that was the initial idea. Like, how do we do that and automate it? I mean, I know people are doing, like, one in one studio, one another, each hitting record at the same time, and then one sending a file to somebody else and them lining it up. I've heard of people who FedExed iPads to other people in a microphone and said, okay, we're going to have you record on your end. Um, and that just seemed ridiculous to me to have to go through all those hoops if we could do it in a, in a tech way. And so that's really what we've done. And now we've expanded that to conference calling as well. So you can have up to five people on a call at the same time, and we sync all five and, and shoot that audio back to you as well. What were some of the main features people were asking for that you discovered? I mean, obviously, one thing, you wanted the audio to be just amazing, like you're in the same room. What were some other features or things that people uh, asked about that you in, you know embedded into the product? Yeah, our focus primarily at first was crystal clear studio quality audio, at least as, as close as we can possibly get to that. But um, for so many, ease of joining a call <laughs> you know so uh, people who are in podcasting or radio are used to technology but the people they're interviewing probably aren't and so totally. having yeah. asking them to jump through a bunch of hoops is um dicey at best uh, a lot of people are like nope not interested don't want to do that I'll, I'll call you but if i can't call you then then we're done uh, and so what we wanted to do was one create something that required little to no effort on the guest's part uh, and so that's why we you don't have to sign up for an account. You don't have to, uh, if you're using your computer, you don't have to download anything. It's literally just open up your browser window and you're recording. Um, and we, we don't want usernames, passwords, anything for the guests. Just tap a link if it's on your phone or click on it if it's on your computer and, and you're, you're good to go. So that was a big one. Um, and we've also had, obviously, everybody likes recording in different um, formats and uh, different bit rates and file types and some people want it all synced into one mono mp3 some people want split track some people want stereo you know and so how do we 
make all those available without confusing the issue. Um, those, at least early on, were our big challenges. And then beyond that, the uh, the conference calling, like we have a co-host in Seattle and a co-host in Dallas, but we want to bring somebody on in Denver. Well, our one-to-one -one thing didn't work for that. So how do we get extra people into the call? And uh, that was the next big challenge. So joining a call you mentioned, right now people can um, call people from your desktop app and then also from their phone how does it work correct yeah you you log in if you're uh, gonna you know a lot of people in podcasting have their own studio setup they like you know like you have a c computer and a microphone and so we we started with the app like no one else does the app thing you that's really difficult to do but we wanted to expand it pretty immediately to using a desktop or laptop because so many people have their own studio and want don't want to use any other setup so what you can do is log into your account in a browser, send an invite to somebody, and then when it's time for the call, you click go on the little you know thing you've created for that call, and they do the same thing on, on their end. And when you're both there at the same time, it connects, you can hear each other, and you start talking, and then click record when you're ready to roll. So, you know, Tim, you have some patent pending, I think it's patent pending technology. It's, At least when I listen to, now. it's patented patent now. Oh, awesome. Yes, oh, yep. congratulations. Thank you. So how long did it take for them to actually create the technology after um, you, you know, because you, six months, you just kind of got feedback and you did some you know, research and then they had to go to work on the technology piece, which yeah, I imagine was Those two was were easy. kind of running simultaneously they a were. little bit. Gotcha. Um, uh, because the the basic framework and the the heavy lifting was going to be the same regardless of, of what our research was finding. It was more of the fine tuning that we were trying to find out. Um, and so from when we started in really July 1st of 2014, it was mid-January of 2015 when we dropped the first iOS beta version of, of the app. Um, very rudimentary, but it worked. It, you had to be iPhone to iPhone. You couldn't use computer, couldn't use Android, but that's sort of what got us started. And then by, I think it was April or May, we were able to, to launch Android. And by the end of the year, we got the desktop piece up and going. Yeah. So I'm curious on the pricing piece, how you came to that. When you originally started asking people about how much would you pay, would you pay, what was the range that you were seeing? What were people saying about yeah, that? Yeah, that's a, that's a dangerous survey to do. Um, <laughs> Especially because... if they're not, they're not pulling out their credit card, right? Right. Right. So some people will say, oh, sure, I'll pay, you know, fill in the blank. But then when they actually have to put their credit card details in, they're like, no, I'm not going to do that. And some people would say, no, I don't really want to pay for something. But when that pain point hits, that's not true. They will pay for it because they need it. Um, and so it, it's it's a bit of a crapshoot trying to figure out what's real here and what's not. Um, we put in uh, a, a range of options like uh, five to 10, 10 to 20, you know, up to 50, whatever. Um, most people ended up in that 15 to $20 range. And after doing some other research about tools that people in the industry were using, everything from Adobe Audition to um, you know, some other tools for doing podcasts, podcasting and broadcasting it seemed like most were kind of in that range and so right. that's where we started um we initially wanted to have one tier that was completely free all the time um the problem with that obviously is you're not making money on it if people are using it uh, but the other problem was uh, it, our free tier was so good like the quality was yeah. so good that the reason to jump to the next totally. paid level that it was hard to get people to make that jump and so we have a free trial now and uh, two different paid yeah. tiers honestly i was looking at your pricing and i was thinking the same thing for the the first tier and the second tier i was yeah. like they both seem great why would somebody yeah. even go to the middle tier and i'm thinking well if they made less storage for the first tier that i would definitely I mean, again, I'm not trying to uh, <laughs> yeah. add barriers, but I was thinking, wow, why, you know, um, obviously the quality at what I saw from the middle tier, and it, it's super, I mean, affordable for anyone. I think the right now as we're recording this, again, this may change, so you, you probably hop on it, but the uh, the basic one is $7.99 a month, mm -hmm. and then the middle tier is $18.99 a month, which are both very reasonable. I mean, we're talking like, a hundred, you know, seventy to two hundred dollars a year for something right. that, especially if you're using it on a weekly basis, is is a steal. 
But uh, the main difference I saw, I mean, obviously the conference calling is big now for the middle tier and mm-hmm. also the, um, you know, the, the quality, the studio quality is, is different. Uh, but I'm sure the, the basic is fantastic. Like I, my ear probably wouldn't even notice the difference. Um, yeah, it, it is. Um, it is negligible in terms of the quality difference. Honestly, most of our users are on the um, premium tier and they are. the reason okay. for that, um, more than anything is the ability to split tracks like mm. on that basic tier it's one mono mp3 so you can um, edit but, it and clean it up right and, yeah, it's totally. way easier to edit and clean up when you got separate tracks some people only want the second track like they're they're recording themselves yeah. on it. their own and they just want great quality from their guests um, and so that's really the big the big the difference track, between totally. the two yep got it um and so how did you decide on this pricing uh, trial and error, yeah. uh, uh, probably emphasis on the error, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it, there's no, uh, I wish there was a formula to say, this is what you do and this is what you look for. And then when you right. see this, you do that. But, uh, for us, the goal is to find the spot where as many people will pay as much as possible. Um, and you hate to say that, you know, to, to well, a you customer, need to, but you need to true. maintain the company. I mean, right. Absolutely. And, I would um, fear, like, even if you had a free version, I was talking to someone who had a free, you know, a founder had a free version. I'm like, you're going to get rid of that because yep. you can't, it's just hard to support. I want to pay for stuff because I know the company's going to be around. They're going to be able to support the product. Yep. Right. And, and for us, that was, that was a challenge. You know, do, do we have that free tier? The ultimate answer became no. Um, Why? what are the differences between the two? You know, how do you make it worth it to jump to the next one? Um, there are all sorts of questions to answer. They're going to be different for everybody, but for us, we just really felt like, um, we were really competitive with that top tier in terms of, of pricing and we felt it was worth the money. And, uh, while we'll offer, you know, people are going to pay for a year in advance, we offer some discounts on that. But, um, that's sort of where we landed based on a little bit of research and then trying it out to see what people wanted to do. So Tim, the, you decided to join the ocean accelerator. All right. Talk about what you learned from, or what is that? And then what you learned from the ocean accelerator. Yeah, that actually had that decision happened during that six months process of, of developing the company. And uh, we had no product. We had no nothing. But um, one of my investors said, hey, you might want to look into this. It was October 30th that he sent me that email. And the deadline for submissions was October 31st. <laughs> um, and so I, I honestly didn't know what I was doing or completely what I was signing up for. I just knew that he thought it was a good idea and that I had no business background and so i should probably think it was a good idea too so we submitted our our materials and uh, about six weeks later they said hey if you want to come come on we want you in our in our inaugural class and uh, essentially an accelerator and this one specifically is designed to sort of be business 101 a boot camp experience to take you from uh product ideation all the way through fundraising and launch and um for me that was perfect because literally every session we sat in was new information to me and uh, i had guys who were working on the product technically speaking but all the other uh legal things and investment things and marketing and all of that was was new And so it was an opportunity for me to learn really, really fast, and it required me moving 250 miles away for six months. So it was an immersive uh, experience. So you're there for six months. Yeah, completely. And um, But I met uh, the guy who is our patent attorney and advisor while I was there. I met several investors, uh, some other mentors who've uh, been with us every step of the way, and a whole bunch of good friends in the process. And uh, it was was worth it for sure. So... It definitely looking back is worth it, but I imagine at the time is a tough decision. I mean, what paint the picture because you're still at the radio station, right? At this point, yeah, I was working full time still, uh, wrestling with uh, do I jump into Ringer full time? Do I just try to uh, eke this along part time doing nights and weekends? And realized when I applied for that accelerator that <laughs> you just if jump. you got accepted, man, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, if I did do this, there is no choice. I have to, our, and our show was a top rated show in a bunch of different markets and we were doing really well. Uh, but my co-host and I had kind of talked about, hey, is, is this sort of the end of our run? Do we want to leave on top? And this was kind of the thing that pushed me over the edge was, you know what, I, I need to do this. And I've always said I would rather fail at greatness than succeed at mediocrity. And to me, 
this was an opportunity to, to go for greatness. And what happened, I, I, I didn't know and still don't know, quite honestly. Um, and as I drove to Cincinnati with literally less than a dollar in our company's bank account, I was wondering if I was doing the right thing. Um, but I had to find out. And I think mm. that's that's really the – if you have to define an entrepreneur – that's sort of a characteristic we all have. We have to know, like, will this work? And I won't. It's a rest horrible until trait. I, I hate that. It trait. is. No, it can be. It, it, it really can be. But it's also <laughs> how uh, the great ones become great, um, because no one else would be willing to be that crazy to try that to give up everything for the sake of an idea um and most of the time it doesn't work that's the unfortunate reality um but sometimes it does and when it does it's really cool to see how people are changed and uh, industries are changed and in, in some cases you know apple and others uh, the world's been changed because someone decided to take a chance yeah i'm just thinking of that drive for you i mean because you were probably in radio for for years right much forever that's the yeah. only thing i knew so did you go in and what did you say to the, the staff or the, the people at the radio station? Just like, I'm out? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, happened pretty quickly. Pam, my co-host, and I had talked about it before. And there were other extenuating circumstances that we thought, you know, maybe, maybe we just want to end on top. And um, so I literally, when I, it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving of 2014 that we sat in our, our office and with the staff and, and both announced that we were leaving after seven or eight years doing the show together. And um, they, of course, asked that question, like, what's next? And, and both of us said, we don't know. Uh, and I literally didn't. I had applied for Ocean, but I had not been accepted. Oh, you hadn't been accepted yet? No. Uh, that was Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and on the Monday after Thanksgiving, I got the phone call that said, you're in. Um, so it was four days over Thanksgiving, five days or so of, uh, I've just quit my job. Uh, there is an end date. What am I going to do? Uh, and then I got that phone call that said, you're in. And that still wasn't an easy decision. I mean, I was glad that there was something there. If I wanted it, but I still didn't know for sure that I wanted it. And it was a couple of weeks of back and forth in my head before I decided to take it. Yeah. Tough decision. Um, what was some of the, again, like you met some great connections there. What was some of the um, advice, some good advice you got during that time? Yeah, the One of the very first days, Scott Weiss, who heads up Ocean, and he was a former CEO at Evenflow and a great guy and a mentor and friend of me now said, um, everything you need to be successful in your company is a cup of coffee away. Hmm. Um, and, and what he meant by that was certainly in Cincinnati, where there's a lot of fortune 500 companies, there are lots of other startups and uh, really a culture of wanting to see the little guy succeed, wanting to see a startup work and taking pride when it does as a community as a whole. And so um, he was right. If you called up people in industry, not every single person, but you know, Procter and Gamble's there and Kroger's there and so many others. If you said, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. Uh, I'd love to pick your brain for 20 minutes at Starbucks downtown. Can I buy you a coffee? Most of them would say yes. Hmm. Um, and I had a lot of those and still do from time to time with people. I'm like, you know what? I just want to learn from you a little bit, share my story, learn more about you. Maybe we can help each other. Um, and, and that, I think, uh, amongst other things, it was sort of the top of my list of ask. Yeah. You know, I, I have, I've always called myself um, entrepreneurial up until Ringer, but I was never an entrepreneur because I was just trying to do things on my, on my own, literally without help. Like, what do I have inside me that I can birth into a gigantic business? And the answer, it turns out, is nothing. Um, <laughs> but I can... Uh, you know, with help and people that I can rally around me who, who know what they're doing and, and have other traits that I don't have, we can create something pretty cool together. And, and that was a, a big focus. Yeah. It's a good saying, you know, one cup of coffee, but you can't replace ringer with that one. You're one ringer away, right? True. If you're doing a podcast or something. Right. And yeah. It, well, I and I you're totally doing the same that. thing, right? Yeah. You're, I mean, you're making connections every day with, with the podcast and uh, those connections uh, whether it's coffee or a podcast or a, a phone call, whatever, yeah. um, those are invaluable. Yeah. So I want to talk about ESPN in a second, but I have to ask, um, what made you get into radio? Is just 
because I remember listening, and I, this is before I knew you had a background in radio. I was just listening to to someone interviewing you. Like this guy has got like a a rock star voice. Like, and then obviously I found the the radio background, etc. But did you? Was it someone told you that, or um, was it something you cultivated? I remember once in high school, somebody said this guy I hadn't seen in a long time. Like we went to elementary school together, and we'd seen each other again for the first time in years. And he's like, dude, you've got a radio voice or whatever. And, uh, that was probably a sophomore in high school. And I literally thought nothing of it until mm. I got working in radio. Uh, I actually studied architecture in college and I oh, thought really? for sure that's what I was going to do. And, and near the end of my freshman year, I just needed a part-time job and, uh, was sitting at church ironically one day looking around going, who here, because I knew it was about relationships at that point. I'm like, I don't want to go apply for a job like at Wendy's and fill out an application. Like, I need to look around and find somebody I know who might be willing to hire me to do something, and then we'll figure it out. And across the way, I saw a guy who worked at a local radio station. I went, that'd be kind of fun. And so I went up to him afterward and just said, hey, I'm looking for a part-time job. I don't know if you guys got anything, but let me know. And uh, his name was Steve, and he said, you want to be on the air? And I went, Okay, sure. And so the overnight before my first college final um, was my first time on the air. And I was on 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. And I was terrible at it, but I fell in love with it. And it wasn't too many months later that I dropped out of school and uh, jumped into radio full time. And then it's really been a development thing, right? You're, you're born with a certain set of tools um, and, and then you've got to develop those. And some do and some don't. And I've been fortunate enough to, to have the time and uh, opportunities to, to do that. And, and now I get to do a whole lot of stuff I love. At what point do you start announcing the uh, Illini basketball? Or is it basketball games? Yeah, basketball I do. Uh, Illinois men's and women's basketball, soccer, and some football. Um, I started the women's basketball, I think this is my seventh season or eighth season. Yeah. Um, and then men's basketball came a year or two later. And then um, the Pacers started this year. So now I'm driving to do NBA games uh, 41 times a year. And I've done some N- uh, WNBA stuff for them, too. Um, and so now it, and, and the Chicago Fire I've been doing for seven or eight years now, too. So um, it's I love sports and I call it paid hobby. You know, it's like. Right. I, I, golf I have to pay and I like would want to kill myself after most rounds um, <laughs> this they pay me and feed me and I get free parking and get to watch sports and, and it doesn't really get hey, any man. better than that so, yeah. what's the toughest part about the job doing the announcing a um, couple of things uh, one is and people don't realize this I've, I've got like four people in my headset all the time so and sometimes they're talking to me and sometimes they're not but I'm having to have a conversation with the audience um, while other conversations are happening in my ear. Um, and so that is kind of difficult sometimes. Uh, you have, you know, in football, you've got spotters. So you've got one guy telling you numbers of the offense in one ear, one guy telling you numbers of the defense in the other ear. Um, and so that just in and of itself, it's kind of hard to process all at the same time and yet speak clearly and, and do so in a way that's interesting. Um, the That'd other be thing fascinating, is, Tim, to record that. Has anyone recorded that internal? You know that would be I, amazing. They should all at once. It would be hard to listen just to. I'm, feel I'm like, just telling you now. This is what I'm listening to as I'm announcing the game. Yeah, and would, it just, you know, totally. It's an interesting idea. I should see if they can pull that off for me. Um, the other thing is, and I'm noticing now that I do a, a, a wide variety of basketball, you know, I do um, – men's and women's NBA and men's and women's in college. And all the rules are not all of the rules. Some of the rules are different in terms hmm. of number of fouls. And if you're play quarters or halves and when you shoot free throws and when you don't, and when you allow subs okay. to come to the game and when you don't. So keeping that straight sometimes is, is a challenge. Like, wait, are we resetting fouls? Are you in the bonus after five? Is it seven or 10? Um, right. Do you pull the horn after a made free throw? Do you not? I mean, all those things. Um, are just you got to remember where you are and uh, which which group you're doing. <laughs> what about names? I mean, when I asked you how to pronounce name, I totally I messed up your name. Your name's not even that difficult, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's um, that's the job. Uh, I I love it because I get to say a whole lot of fun names, and sometimes you just got to sit and practice <laughs> for a while. Really, um, I, and I always go to. Who the, the, in college as a sports information director, usually it's a PR person with the NBA, and just say, all right, I'm going to run through these. You tell me if I get them wrong. And then if I do, I write them out phonetically so that I make sure I get them right. Yeah. Um, 
And people these days are into spelling names weird but saying them normally or saying them weird but spelling them normally. And so that's why I ask about them all. It's like, is that Sarah? No, it's Sarah. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, you know, it's just like whatever. So <laughs> There's I a Key and Peele episode that you have to listen to. Yes. I don't know. Have you seen yes. that one? Oh, I know, I know it. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, the several I won't say. If the, but if the funny. notes, uh, the sh- the show notes writer, you can link the Key and Peel episode. Yes, yeah. A. A. Ron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. An announcer's but, nightmare. <laughs> yes. So I've got like this year on the men's basketball team, we've got a Georgie Bashanishvili, and uh, the women's team has a Nancy Panagatopoulou, and there's a few others that you know that are just. They're long, and if you look at them too hard, then you'll screw them up. But if you memorize them, then you're right. Um, ESPN. So how did ESPN become a customer? Yeah, they uh, in it's been more uh, individuals through ESPN. We've talked with them corporately, and uh, hopefully that is something that will happen down the line. But they are in the business, like uh, NPR and a few others uh, that we deal with on a regular basis, um, that they do this kind of thing all the time. And there are a variety of solutions um, for for the big names, you know, ISDN, and some people have TV or whatever trucks in different locations and studios set up, so they don't need what we provide. A little more cost prohibitive than like $18.99 right. a month. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. So um, in a lot of the podcasting um, arenas where, you know, they've got people working from their house or from their car or whatever uh, all the time now, um, we are an option for them. So uh, we'll get emails from time to time with somebody with the uh, at ESPN.com, you know, on their uh, email and uh, try to help them out when we can. And uh, it's been fun to see. It's more than anything. It's sort of justifies for me the fact that I was able to create something and fill a need and a void that that is there. And it wasn't just me with a low budget radio station, which we weren't really a low budget radio station, but it wasn't just something that I experienced, but literally Everybody at some time who's in this business uh, understands the pain, and uh, hopefully we're able to help. Yeah. So, Tim, what have you seen? I mean, we know some of the normal use cases, right? People use it for interviewing, all sorts of people. What Are there any interesting use cases that you found now that you put it out there? Um, we've heard from a lot of sort of one-off things, uh, trying to get um, – I had one with uh, a guy who – I believe it was his mom or grandmother was really sick and wasn't close, but they wanted her voice and they wanted conversations for their kids that Mm. they could listen to. And so when you can get audio that way and you can't be there, um, they were able to record some audio um, of her and and keep it that way. And military, same kind of thing when they're overseas and you, you... you get these really mm. staticky, crackly phone calls. It's a good way to to get some some high quality mm. audio. But We've mostly. also heard from lawyers and depositions, or uh, in the in the medical field with doctors who need you know when you have crappy audio, you get tramp, crappy transcription. And so anybody who's mm. trying to transcribe audio, um, this is a way to get really high quality audio, so the transcription's better. Um, so those are some other ways that we're like, oh, that's kind of fun. Hadn't really even thought about that, but uh, people are using it. Nice. Um, growing user base, um, what's, what's worked and what things have not worked that you thought would work? That is the million dollar question. Isn't it? <laughs> um, we, we've gone through a number of iterations of things. We've been, I feel like operating on a, on a shoestring from the very beginning. Um, we're low overhead, uh, low cost outlay. I mean, we raised some money, but not as much as some others. And so we've tried to be super careful about where we spend our money and make sure we test everything and and don't pour a bunch into money a bunch of money into something that's not proven um so we've focused on um a number of things uh, direct email marketing to our existing users or at least people who've requested information from us uh we've gone to facebook and twitter and some paid advertising there um and and quite honestly those paid things haven't panned out like we've hoped um We've seen a little, uh, but podcasting, thankfully for us, has proven to be an industry full of early adopters and full of people who, when they find something they like, are willing to tell others about it. And the others that they're telling are also really likely to be other podcasters because podcasters listen to podcasts like five to one or six to one as 
compared to the normal person. So um, we, we've got an audience that wants to try new things uh, and then has liked us and told their audience about the new things they're trying. And that audience happens to be our customers. And so we've really seen fairly decent growth through word of mouth and through um, programs that we've put in place on our website to try to encourage that. Um, and we're letting that roll for the most part while also doing a few other things here and there, but man, uh, we've been in an industry that uh, has worked really in, in our favor in that respect. Yeah, I mean, totally. Like when we're <clears throat> we're doing a podcast for someone, they're, they want to know what tools they should be using, yep. and or if someone's asking me a question on what equipment do I use, it's just one of the things that you tell people, right? right. So it just kind of organically happens. Um, who should be using it that maybe isn't yet? Is it certain podcasters or certain industries? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I won't call anybody out, but any specifically, but anybody uh, in the podcast space who's trying to connect with one or two or up to five people and is doing so just through the phone or recording um, a feed. I mean, if, if you're plugged into a network and are recording that feed, it's, it's not too bad most of the time. Um, but man, if you if you got somebody on the other end who it has to be on their phone or is on a computer that's on a home network and you just get that drop out and every fourth word you can't hear, yeah, man, there, there's a solution. I promise you there is, and um, it'll sound so much better <laughs> when you when you try it out. I also think like, um, and I mentioned him a little bit in, in the legal and medical worlds, I think this is going to become more and more a thing where um, you need ways to record what's happening, whether it's business meetings or a deposition or a consultation, those things can be done and, and transcribed pretty easily using our platform. And uh, I'd like to see that play out a little bit more over the coming years. Yeah. Um, you have a portion of your site on Ringer. Um Worst interviews. <laughs> what is that? And uh, tell me your, your favorite worst interview. Yeah, that. Um, so the idea behind that podcast, I think we did 40 episodes or so uh, last year, maybe the year before. And, and the, the idea behind that was was twofold. One, like I said, I don't bring a whole lot to the table, but interviewing people and radio was my thing. So it was, how can we use some of my strengths to uh, increase our brand awareness and and do something fun in the process? And so a podcast was the idea. As I was going through ideas for the podcast, I was thinking through questions like, what am I going to ask? What are we going to focus on? I was going to focus on like the art of the interview was kind of the idea. And one of the first questions I wrote down for, for that was, what's your worst interview ever? Mm. And I went, screw the rest of that. This needs to be the podcast. Totally. Like, this is way better. So um, that's what we went with and tried to interview interviewers uh, about their worst experiences. And one, it was to have a little fun, but two, it was to help spread the word about Ringer. And so every single one we recorded, we recorded on Ringer, talked a little bit about it. It wasn't a commercial, but we sponsored ourselves, essentially. Totally. And um, it was a whole lot of fun. Heard some great stories, everything from uh, rock stars who thought they were doing an audio only interview and they were, but they turned the camera on accidentally. And so the guy was interviewing this rock star who's wandering around his house with the camera on. And so he's seeing everything that's happening around him while only recording the audio. But, um, that was, that was a funny one. Uh, a guy who was in a third world country interviewing a young woman about the, I think the plights of poverty and, uh, all of us, you know, in third world countries, modesty is a different thing than it is here. And she had her little two or three year old who was hungry right in the middle of the interview and was still breastfeeding him and just, started doing it right in the middle of the interview and um so a number of those that are uh super funny and awkward and uh you know people who are just royal jerks and there's there's a there's a wide variety of them but uh, we had some great stories yeah yeah people should check that out too um tim first of all thank you um this has been fantastic i love hearing this i have one two last questions but people should check out ringer Dot com. It's R A I N G R dot com. And if you're looking for, like we talked about in the front of the interview, um, just 
like you're in the same room with someone. It's clear. It works its magic as it uploads. I don't know how it works because it's patent. So you, you know, you uh, it's protected in some fashion, but you know, it balances it and does does its thing. So it comes out clear on the other side. Um, Tim, since this is Inspired Insider, I always ask, what's been a a low moment that you had to push through, and then what's been a proud moment? Um, what's been a low moment that you had to push through? Because uh, um, starting a company is not wise, easy. Like Ringer, yeah. yeah. Um, man, there's there's a lot of them. I, I had a friend who, who would tell me before I ever started this, you know, in business it always takes longer than it takes and it costs more than it costs. Um, and whatever you assume it's going to be, you know, add a lot. Um, and I think I've been through several low points of this is going to cost more than we have uh, or take longer than we have. And, you know, the, the key to succeeding in the startup, at least early on, is keeping the lights on tomorrow. Um, and, you know, it, the goal is always that, you know, seven figure exit and, you know, IPO or whatever. But and for a dreamer, that's what you want to focus on. Right. But when you're leading a company, um, you know, when I had 88 cents in my bank account, I, I couldn't dream about a seven figure exit or an IPO. I had to go, you know, can I pay my Amazon AWS storage costs next month? Um, so those are sort of struggles that that I have and I think every entrepreneur or founder has of um my dream is like 2 weeks away pretty much all the time from completely collapsing <laughs> um, right <laughs> and and that's that's hard to live with while you're trying to lead and innovate and um do the right thing right. um and there is no manual for the right thing you just got to figure it out um for me I think um and I'm, I'm not a golfer at all, though I brought it up one other time today. I, the startup process is a little like golf, like at least my golf game. Like you go around the course, you hit it in the weeds, you hit it off trees, into the water, you're fighting off geese to get to your ball or whatever. Um, and and it's a slog. And you're like on 13th hole going, I'm never, ever, ever going to play golf again in my entire life, ever. It's just terrible. And then on the 14th tee, you rip one right down the center and you go i could go pro you know like this <laughs> this is amazing um and i feel like the process has been a little bit of that it, you know it's a slog and you're in the weeds and you're rustling with all sorts of things and then you get a phone call uh or you you get a support ticket from a famous person who you go holy crap you use our product this is amazing um and and that gives you the energy to go man, this slog is worth it. You know, it's hard, um, but uh, we really are doing something worthwhile. We do have people who, who care and, and big name people who care, and that's enough to play another round tomorrow. Yeah, moments of brilliance for sure. Yeah, I yeah. get that. Select, but yes. <laughs> what about proud moments? Yeah, I mean, I think some of those phone calls I mentioned would fall into that category of, um, you know, for me as a communicator – realizing and seeing actual evidence that something I've communicated has, has resonated with somebody to the point that they're going to spend money and trust me and my company to do work for them. That's a big deal. Um, and so anytime I get to talk with somebody who says, Hey, you know, I've, I've used your product. Um, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. And, and sometimes we don't even meet because of ringer, for example, um, I uh, I went on a date a few months ago with with somebody completely out of the blue. Didn't know this person. Um, she didn't know anything about me really, other than the basics. And we got talking. She's like, "Yeah, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. I was on one recently. Um, that was pretty cool." I'm like, "Oh, I work at a company that helps with podcasts." And she's like, "What is it?" And I said, "Ringer." She's like, "Oh my gosh, we use you to do the interview that I just did a few weeks ago." And so, like, even small stuff like that. I mean, it's stupid in the grand scheme of things, but. It, it really is fulfilling. Cool. And those are proud moments for me. So, and it, it leads to a second date. No, it I'm might lead to a second date. That, that <laughs> no, <was> that's <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim. I I have a question about voice health. Um, I'm curious about. You know, you use your voice. I remember a couple weeks ago, I was going to do an interview, and I just my throat was scratchy. And I was like, well, I don't have to announce 
at the Pacers game or anything. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be fine for me. Right. What do you do pre and post to make sure like your voice stays how it should? Got to make athletes stretch. What do you do? Right. Well, it, it is a muscle. And so using the muscle helps strengthen it just in general. Uh, that doesn't necessarily help when it, it's hurting, but leading up to it, it keeps you from hurting as often when it's something that you work so frequently. And so I talk all day, every day. Um, and usually I'm, I'm pushing, you know, certainly at public address events I am. Um, so that, that helps. However, uh, I do get a cold. I do get tired. Uh, I do work two games in a day sometimes. And, um, you know, I, I wish I had a, a tried and true method that from beginning to end. I figured every time. you're like I have a special elixir that I gargle with after each. No, if I something. start to feel anything in yeah. my throat, I take I do the emergency, dump it in some water, stir it up, and drink that. Uh, usually first thing in the morning to fight off any cold or sinus junk um, because that's really the biggest problem. Knock on wood, I, I haven't had strep throat or any throat issues for for a couple of decades, but I'll get a cold from, from yeah. time to time. And uh, sometimes you just got to push through it and you, you're not going to sound the same, but you got to sound okay. Um, my, my voice has cracked at a soccer match or two when you've got that head cold that you're trying to, to fight. Um, but it happens, right. and uh, you, you do what you got to do. I have your throat lozenges and uh, tea, warm tea from time to time, but I don't have any super secret formula. No, okay. Just curious. Uh, yeah, good question, though. All right. Thank you, Tim. I just want to be the first one to you know really appreciate you taking the time. Everyone check out ringer.com and uh, have fun at the Pacers game. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to be on. Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand